Thanks very much and uh, hello everyone. Um, I was um, uh, on my way to a training course in Manchester when uh, Joanne said, ah, now if you got off the train at Llanderbeer, you could get on the next one and head up north. <laughs> so, um, so for the, with, the, with the bribe of the princely fee of a cup of coffee and some sandwiches, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm away. Um, so it's um, generally what I'm going to do today is kind of have a run through an overview of all the sort of welfare reforms um, that are going on. Uh, welfare reform is sort of a mixed thing. Sometimes it's used for all of the changes coming together and sometimes it's used for the more ambitious changes because there are two sorts of changes going on. One is that they want to save some money and any, as they want to do from every department in government so they're looking for savings from the welfare budget. The other bit is to do with actually they've got some ideas of wanting to change the system well, you know, which they imagine or they hope to be for the better. I'm being very politically neutral here. Um, and uh, so there were was, there was some big ideas going on as well as just wanting to save some money. Um, just a bit about who am I. Um, as uh, Joanne said, I'm from the Big Book of Benefits, which is a new sort of venture, which is named after something that's been going for ages, which is uh, the Big Book of Benefits and Mental Health, um, which was um, the sort of baby of my late partner um, who um, uh, wrote this. This, isn't, this is its 12th edition, and I'm working on the 13th now. Um, last year, I joined her as, as um, co-author because it was getting bigger and bigger, and now now, uh, sadly, I'm moving on on my own. So as well as doing the, the big book um, with vague ideas of other big books to come, um, you know, um, the aim of the book, which I'll leave a copy with Joanne, is, is to actually do a kind of demystifying practical um, mm -hmm. uh, guide to the system. So whereas there are plenty of good guides that will tell you what the law says and turn that into plain English, um, there, there aren't, um, this has got much more practical bullet points and example forms, that sort of thing. It's from a mental health perspective, but a lot of it, mental health aspects can carry on into all sorts of diagnoses uh, and difficulties, and sometimes they're the hardest to kind of um, put on a form so um, it has a wider use as well and there's nothing like it in other areas so that's something we're working on. The other thing I do uh, is a bit of writing, I do a column for ben um, Mental Health Today and uh, run benefits training courses which gives me, um, keeps the cat in munches and gives me the wherewithal to come and, uh, come and do some talks as well. Um, we have a website which is grossly out of date and uh, you know not uh, done in the first flush of excitement at marketing ideas and things like that but needs definite tending to um, because our business did take a bit of a, uh, a back seat while I, I had the uh, um, joy and privilege and worries that you all have of being a carer for a few months. Um, we were hoping obviously to uh, to be long-term carer and uh, a long-term thing, but the, the wee timorous beastie of cancer had other ideas. So why are they doing it? Um, why all this welfare reform? Why are they changing? Just, is it just for the sake of change? Well, plan A is they want to save some money, and it's 27,000 million is being saved from the welfare budget. That's a lot of money being saved. And proportionately, it's probably a higher level than some other departments. It's not, you know, the NHS is not being cut, for example, although it fit, sometimes feels like it, whereas the welfare, reform, uh, welfare budget is being cut proportionately more. There's also a perception that social security system is hard for people to understand. Which benefits are you on? Why am I getting the particular rate of DLA that I'm on? That sort of thing. Um, and fair enough, yes, the benefit system could do with simplifying, uh, we all know that. That it's somehow spiralling out of control and unaffordable and in extreme moments um, when they're having a go at the last lot for getting us into this mess. It was all due to being far too profligate <coughs> with, the, with the benefits budget. Um, this, um, as, as this is being filmed, and it's the first time I've ever been on film, I shall restrain my language. Um, <laughs> But I would suspect this argument amounts to a heap of dingoes' kidneys um, and somehow that it's being spent on the wrong people who need more active support and encouragement to come off benefits. So you get all these sort of sound bites about welfare dependency and, and all of those kind of things, which 
fair enough if there's a problem, but some of the problems are actually not, don't, aren't backed up by the st statistics. I should not say that word on film. Uh, and the government statisticians are quite cross with the DWP at some of the um, misuse that they're doing at the moment. The government says, well, from the horse's mouth, the coalition government has identified two key problems with the current benefit system. Work incentives are poor and the system is too complex. We are reforming the system to help people to move into and progress into work while supporting the most vulnerable. Reforming the benefit system aims to make it fairer, more affordable and better able to tackle poverty, worklessness and welfare dependency. We are committed to overhaul the benefit system to promote work and personal responsibility. Some of that is all sort of, you know, general apple pie and motherhood and all of that, all good things. Some of it, you know, you think, ah, personal responsibility, what does that mean? Well, we'll see as we go look at some of the welfare reforms. It's putting more of an onus on the claimant or on you as carers if you're acting as appointee for the claimant, um, that sort of thing. All this thing of moving into work, though, well, that's great to encourage and support people into work. The difficulty is puts extra pressure on people who are not perhaps in the position to move into work at the moment. Here's benefits expenditure. This is the only graph, I promise, <laughs> going out of control. And you can see most of them are actually sort of toddling along. Um, I mean, this ends in 2010. What's happened is yeah, the benefits budget's going up as it does in every recession because there were more unemployed people. The ones that are really going ooh, a bit at the top there, housing benefit. Well, that's not to do with benefit claimants getting loads of money in their pockets, because that's money that's going to the landlords. What that is to do with is the failure of governments of both, part, of both and all parties to actually have a, an affordable um, social housing um, scheme. So instead of putting money into subsidising housing, for the last 20, 30 years, the consensus has been the market will sort that out. And what's happened is the market hasn't sorted it out, so housing benefit has rocketed through the roof. Partly because there are a few more people on it, as people are on low wages and things, but mainly because in s right across the land, uh, rents have gone up, but in the sort of southeast of England, they have shot up beyond control. But your Londoner is on the same, has got the same disposable money as a claimant in, in Ammonford or Llanderbeer. It's just their total benefits bill might be a lot higher because of the rent. The other one that's gone up a little bit, that slow sloping line, which would be in a nice purple, this one here, is um, disability living allowance. And that's gone up for a very good reason. It was intended to go up because since DLA started, we've had community care as an idea. You know, it used to be that the system sort of grudgingly allowed a few people at home, but mostly if lots of people with long-term disabilities were com confined, you know, into long-term hospitals, you know, the, whether it's mental health asylums or hence or for people with learning difficulties and so on. Um, so um, that change, there have been huge savings to the NHS budget. Some of that is extra payment in disability living allowance. Um, yeah, some figures or whatever, but just some myths, I guess. Um, overall spending has potted around between 9 and 11%. It goes up when the economy goes, gets into trouble and it, goes, it will go down as the economy grows again. Um, 165 billion, that's a lot of money, but 94 billion of that is, is to older people and pensions. Um, and we're not the most generous. All this talk of all these, you know, apparently, according to certain newspapers, the entire population of Romania and Bulgaria is queuing up to take advantage of our benefit system. Well, they might pass through 11 other countries with much more, 10 other countries with more generous benefit systems, um, if, that was, if that was the motive. But yes, yeah, some, some headlines have got everybody moving out of Romania and Bulgaria and landing up just outside the Daily Mail offices. Um, <laughs> But um, no disrespect to anybody who, who reads the Daily Mail, but uh, they, they do wind me up at times. Um, so uh, before we get, in, get understanding all of these changes um, can be tricky enough. It's sometimes useful to get a handle. How can we get a handle on the existing benefit system? And this is something I use a lot in my training. Um, to try and there were about 40, 50, depends how you count them, uh, benefits. Um, and what this idea is it's taken from the sound of music which is uh, my partner was into in a, in a big way um, and that scene where they're doing do re mi going up and down the steps 
Um, and these are the steps. If you go through the steps and ask yourself the right questions, you'll get the maximum entitlement benefit. So step one will be the old-fashioned earnings replacement benefits. They date back to the beverage reforms after the Second World War. The ones where you can't work for whatever reason, you're sick, you're unemployed, you're widowed, you're, you're retired, and you get one of those. You could, you could um, apply for several, but you only get paid one of them. Um, and the issue there, for carers particularly, is normally it's not worth claiming more than one, but claiming carer's allowance, even if you're getting another one, is something worth doing. Um, because you get some extra um, extra money in step two. Step two is a means-tested benefits. Um, step one are all entirely non-means-tested. They're nothing to do with how much savings you've got, what your partner's earning, whatever. Step two, you will be assessed jointly with a partner. It will re reflect your savings. But because step one benefits have been seen as old-fashioned and have been withered away slightly, Step two has become a lot more important, partly because of that and partly because of deliberate um, actions to tackle pension of poverty by the last government pension credit did mean that you know, nobody, no, no pensioner at least, should be in, absolute, in the absolute poverty levels because pension credit levels are quite a, you know, they're not hugely generous by any means, but they bring you up to a certain level. Um, and then there are the extra non-means tested benefits, things like mainly for disability or for children. They're always paid on top of anything else. So you go through the steps, which is my best earnings replacement benefit? Should I claim more than one? Can I get a top up for means tested benefit? Could I get disability living allowance, attendance allowance? And then you step back to step two because um, getting disability living allowance or attendance allowance can improve the amount of um, uh, benefit uh, you'll get um, in under means tested benefits. There are extra amounts in means tested benefits, both for carers and for people with disabilities. So here's examples of how, how it works. Mr. Notwell, you can see where I got that from. <laughs> uh, Mr. Notwell is getting contributory employment and support allowance. Um, as his main his earnings replacement benefit. That's what used to be called sickness benefit. But because we want to make benefits simpler, it's now known as contributory employment support allowance in the main phase with work-related activity component. Because <laughs> that's much easier to say. And Mr. Notwell, for whatever reason, perhaps because of extra premiums or whatever, um, also gets a top-up from income-related employment support allowance under step two. If there's rent to pay, housing benefit, council tax benefit, for, um, well, it's now council tax support, but this is under the old system. This was examples of current claims up until the 1st of April. Um, and then disability living allowance paid on top. A lot of people sort of get confused about between, and the government included, get confused between benefits for sickness, like employment support allowance, which is to do with the fact that you cannot work, and benefits for disability, disability living allowance and attendance allowance for older people, which is about help you need because you've got extra costs from living with a long-term illness or disability. You can have DLA whether you're in work or not in work um, and um, it's always paid on top of employment support allowance. Mrs Wise, she's very wise because she's made sure that she's a pension age before this welfare reform kicks in because we'll see in a moment that it's mainly aimed at the working age population. Um, She's getting retirement pension, getting a top up if she, if she needs it from pension credit, again housing benefit, council tax benefit. And for her the disability benefit is attendance allowance because she claimed after the age of, first claimed after the age of 65. And then Miss Caring, a carer, um, she looks after Mrs Wise, she gets carer's allowance as her step one benefit. If she hasn't got much money coming in, then income support would top up her carer's allowance. And again, housing benefit and council tax benefit would help with the rent. And there's no, if Miss Caring, a lot of carers have disabilities of their own, and there is no contradiction if Miss Caring also had disabilities for her to be a carer and also claim disability living allowance if, if need be. So that sort of makes sense in your experience that you have of, of benefits, that sort of... It just gives us a grounding before we shoot on into what's changing. Um, there's 
loads of stuff going through. This is going to be a bit of a cook's tour, but what I will do is I'll um, send to uh, Joanne, she can circulate, a, a sort of summary table of all of the changes. So if you, and not everyone might be interested in having all that detail, but it, there she can send it round on if you're on email or whatever, um, or print it off, whichever. Um, but it kind of tries to capture all of the changes since t 2010 in a kind of table format. Um, and you can print it off on, it's actually, it's uh, one of those things that depends on what size of printer paper you put in. So if you print it off on A3, it becomes more easy to read. Um, so that's the current system. Um, there's a big difference between welfare reform for people over pension age and um, people under pension age. So just to kind of summarise everything that's happening, and then we'll pop in and look at some of the detail in the benefits most relevant both to carers and to the people you, you're caring for. So no big changes for people who are currently in retirement, um, although there are some cuts going on in pension credit which kind of is a bit at odds because what the government is saying is when they are making cuts that they're going to protect the most vulnerable. Well, it's a bit slightly odd because people who might be on any income getting retirement pension from, from people with nothing bar their pension to people billionaires or, or retired chief executives or whatever on nice pensions, they'll get... Um, oh, they'll be okay, but the people of the poorest pensioners who rely on pension credit aren't quite getting the same percentage increases. They're getting the cash increases, which means a real cut. Um, there are protections for older people. There's this triple lock guarantee, as the government says, on retirement pension. It will always go up by whichever's the greater earnings, inflation, or 2.5%. So this year it's gone up by 2.5%. Um, only cash increases for pension credit. The change to council tax benefit, we're not getting the blast so much here in Wales. Uh, over in England, it's down to every local authority to work out how on earth they're going to balance the books because they've been given the money. They've always administered council tax, but they've been given the money, um, minus 13%. Uh, and told to work out their own scheme as to how they're going to make it work, which means that different councils are coming up with different ideas. Some councils are saying they're going to charge everybody something because they're desperately, they think that's going to be the best way to get the money. Uh, others are going, hold on, we remember the poll tax, we're not going to do that. Um, and then they're going to have to do other adjustments to make the books balance. What we've got in Wales for this year is the uh, Welsh Government have made up the difference, the missing bit. So effectively, the scheme being run is exactly the same as last year's council tax benefit scheme but it's not technically council tax benefit and during this year they'll be working out what do they do for next year but it will probably be a Wales wide scheme so you won't have this sort of what's you know which side of are you in lower Brynamon or upper Brynamon you know as to, as to which how your council tax benefits worked out Ooh. Student log on. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> um, the non means tested extras are staying for now. So while they're cutting the poorest pensioners, everybody, your winter fuel payments and your, your, your TV licenses and everything else is, is all totally safe. Um, there's a big argument going on because the Chancellor would like to have that money because. Um, you know, it's about five billion quid there. Um, the Prime Minister's saying no because Mrs. Wise and older people are very wise in that they vote. <laughs> so, uh, and a promise was a specific promise was made. So, and um, actually, in that in that argument, I would agree with the prime minister. He's right, but for totally the wrong reasons. Because I think lots of you know, on my soapbox, and I'll get straight off it again. Um, that there is a case for benefits to be made universal and non-means tested because it means actually it gets to the poorest more easily and it's much simpler. Um, but um, let's do that for all the benefits then. Oh no, says the Prime Minister. Where the welfare reform is hitting older people is more about people coming up to retirement. Um, there's the equalisation of pension age going on, so women are gradually, women now reach pension age of 61 and a half, or 61 and eight months, I think, just about to tip to. Um, Eventually, uh, in a few years' time, it will be 65. And then, hand, to, hand in hand together, we will go, men and women will march happily into a retirement age of 66, then 67, and then after that, it's not specifically announced, but it will, there's talk that it will end up at some, in a long, long time, um, long after my time, um, it will be 73. 
um, retirement pension. They're going to base it on whatever's happening to the, the living longer statistics or longevity statistics. The other big change, which some will be great winners from and some will be losers from, is a new merged retirement pension for mm -hmm. people who are retiring, and they've brought that forward one year. So anyone who's collecting their pension for the first time in April 2016 will get um, a joined-up pension, which will be their basic pension, the SERPs and second pension, and pension credit, savings credit, will all be rolled up into one payment, the full pension of which will be about £144. Now, some people will think, well, hey, that's a lot better than the current 110 or whatever, um, and uh, they get all their works pensions on top. Other people who've got lots of money invested in the second state pension and SERPs for their retirement might be losers. So there's got swings and roundabouts there. I don't know if I can, maybe we can get rid of this thing. It's always a dangerous position to adopt with a camera. But, uh, <laughs> right. Now, what the exciting bit, what's happening in welfare reform in working age? Well, here, there isn't any of that protection about increases going on. Right, there's a general cuts going on for everybody who's on benefits of working age. They changed the up rating. It sounds very techy, you know, the, the index they use for increasing benefits each year. This does apply to pensioners, but pensioners have this guarantee that um, so they're protected from it. So overall, um, they're using what they call the consumer price index, which went up 2.2%, whereas in the past they used the retail price index, which would have given an increase of 2.6%. Well, what's a few percent and a few pence? Any one year, it doesn't make a huge difference. But cumulatively, it's like compound interest. It's making a big difference. It's the biggest cut of all. It's going to save the government £6.5 billion pounds, uh, by uh, 2015. On top of that, we had the announcement along with discussions about uh, workers, shirkers and curtain arrangements back in the autumn of last year when it was decided that why should people on, um, uh, who are on benefits do any better than people who are in work who are actually facing wage freezes or small increases or actual cuts? To which I would say, that's fine. Let's join up the fortunes of people on benefits and people in work and, and join them up together. And yes, it will mean pain in these next three years because we're in a recession, so people in work are suffering. But then after that, the long-term trend is that people will get more as the economy grows, which is why this country is better off. It doesn't feel better off this year than last year, but it feels a lot better off if you think about living standards 20 years ago and what, what we could get and what we expected uh, for, for people. Um, but no, this, as soon as, uh, it's, this is only for three years because they're hoping the recession's over by then. And in three years, they'll come up with arguments as to why should people on benefits get, get gains, you know, we'll separate out people on benefits then. So this is really just short-term opportunism. Oh, I've said it now, it's on record. Um, <coughs> Uh, it's going to be a 4% real cut. So what's going to happen is in three years' time, they'll unhitch people on benefits who will be left behind as, as the train moves on, as the rest of the country moves on, left behind on rates which were actually last thought about and set as, a, as the basic poverty line back in the 1960s. And that is what means-tested benefit rates are now. They're just a, a, a real you know, inflation-protected increase. Even the late lamented Margaret Thatcher, who's so loved in these parts, never actually broke the, went this far with benefits. The benefits cap is uh, one, it's going to affect some people in this area, not many. It's, it's, really, it's mainly going to affect London and the South East, about 67,000 people, which sounds a lot, but it's, it's, it's done for a headline rather than for an actual real policy intention and it's all about why should people who are on benefits get any more money than the average person working well if the person if the average person working was in london renting a house at london rates they would be getting help with housing benefit and working tax credit so it doesn't actually add up um, the cost of it is going to be more than um, uh, than uh, all the knock-on effects of, and disruption to families. And disruption From a carer's point of view, there's no protection for somebody who's caring. There is protection for people who are disabled. 
but the carer who might live in another ho house down the road is not protected. The fact that they need to be there for caring, and though you can commute in from Hastings to go and do your caring in London, is, is the logic of it. Then there's lots of cuts going on in existing benefits. I'm not going to list them all, you'll be pleased to know, but they'll all be on that sheet, that, um, uh, that table that I'll send to Joanne. Housing benefit has suffered lots of rent restrictions, and of course there is this April, the bedroom tax, which is bringing over ideas from the private sector tenants have had to face into uh, for council and um, uh, council tenants and housing association tenants for the first time. Tax credits, um, it's a bit political going on there because this, this was a flagship of the last government, so therefore it has to be rubbish, just as vice versa, it would be the other way around. Um, so there's been lots of freezing cuts in elements, increasing of tapers, um, big savings overall are being made in, in tax credits, which is slightly odd because tax credits are all, of, um, well not child tax credit, that's, that's about ending child, you know, tackling child poverty. But working tax credit, which is where a lot of the cuts are happening, is the benefit for people moving into work, including people with disabilities, who, are, if they are able to move into work, might well what you, you know, have working tax credit as something to top up their low earnings. So they're actually cutting the bit where, which is rewarding people for doing the right thing in, in the government's eyes. So that's a bit weird. Um, child benefit has been frozen so they're protecting the vulnerable there, and affluence tested. And then there's this one-year time limit for many people on the contributory employment support allowance. Then there's a general increase in conditionality and in stigma, so you're getting all these pronouncements and speeches, you know, which are quite, quite frankly outrageous ones, um, uh, based on myths and misinformation. Um, and in that sense, uh, I mean, all governments play the game. They want to manage the mood. They want to win people's support for the changes. But it's got quite vicious and brutal at times. And then there are these three big structural changes to the benefit system, which are going to affect people with disabilities, may be affected by all three. And this is what it will look like once the new system is all in, fa all in place. So these are our three people again. Mr Notwell continues to get his contributory employment support allowance, assuming he keeps passing the tests. Um, but instead, all the uh, means-tested benefits are going to be wrapped up into universal credit. The one that they've left outside of universal credit is council tax support. That wasn't meant to be. The original plan was universal credit would include that. Um, but in the name of localism, the government have managed to do a, a, a cunning cut and dump the dump the dump the bill on the doorsteps of local government. So there's some very cross conservative councils who are very cross with their conservative government. And then the personal independence payment is going to replace the disability living allowance for, um, uh, for people um, with disabilities. Mrs Wise is relatively unaffected, as I was saying, she's an existing pensioner. The one change she may notice, apart from the council tax changing to council tax support, but even in England, people over pension age are protected, so they're going to have the same effective benefit as they used to have. Pension credit is now going to have to include something for rent because housing benefits going to be abolished under universal credit and is also going to include something for pensioners who are looking after younger people or children because in the past they would have claimed child tax credit for that. Um, but that's going as well because of you know, that's rolled into universal credit. Universal credit is not available to pensioners so therefore they're going to have to add it in to the pension credit um, so as not to um, and then attendance allowance is totally unaffected. This personal independence payment is only for people of working age. It doesn't affect uh, people with disabilities uh, above work, uh, pension age. Miss Caring, carer's allowance carries on, totally unaffected by the changes. It is affected by the uh, l limits on um, increases though, because although the carer's allowance is protected, universal credit and her income or income support at the moment um, isn't protected. Well, the carer's, carer's premium bit, the bit for being a carer is protected, but the basic amount for being a, uh, that you'll have to live on is at 1%. So carers who, look, who have to get income support own, are only getting a 1.9% increase this year. In other words, a real cut, despite the fact that, again, you are doing what the government wants you to do. You are the big society. And here's a kick in the teeth to prove it. Mm. Get off my soapbox, I'm being naughty. <laughs> So benefits for carers, what does welfare reform mean for carers? For carers of working age, 
carer's allowance, as before. But the question mark is, will the person I'm looking after make it through the transition from disability living allowance to PIP? Because if they don't, as you know, your carer's allowance is tied in to, to disability living allowance or in future into PIP. And if they don't pass the test, then there's a problem. Um, but we'll have a look at that. Hopefully they, they will. There's that real cuts in value of benefits. And then there's that switch to universal credit ahead if you're a carer who's getting either income support or some carers are, are doing a bit of low paid work as, or you know, doing some hours of work and claiming working tax credit. Mm -hmm. Well, those are both going to disappear and be replaced by universal credit. So that might be a, a direct effect on carers. So, yeah, I mean, I won't say, you, put, you know, this is all existing. There's no great change. Um, the main thing about carer's allowance, it doesn't pay much in itself. It's 59.75 a week. Um, but it does also trigger extra amounts on the, mean, the carer's premium, which is why it's worth claiming carer's allowance, even if you're getting another step one benefit. And you get those letters back from carer's allowance saying, sorry, you, don't, you can't qualify for carer's allowance. Um, although you are a carer and you're doing all, everything else and the person's getting the right benefits, all of that's fine, but because you're already getting more than carer's allowance in retirement pension or in, in your own incapacity benefit or whatever it might be, um, you, we can't actually pay you any carer's allowance. But do show this letter to if you're applying for means tested benefits because you get an extra £30 allocated in your means tested benefits. Um, so there's Miss Caring looks after her friend Mr Notwell, um, so her applicable amount this year for income support purposes, she's a lone, she's a lone single person, um, no children or partner, £105 made up of 71.70 the personal allowance and 33.30 that carer's premium. Um, her only income is a carer's allowance, 59.75, so they take the carer's allowance off pound for pound, but what it's done is it's given her that carer's premium. Wee, that one there. Um, so as a result, she gets £45.25 income support to top her up to £105, and that's how income support works for... Um, so the carer's allowance and the premium will go up by the full 2.2%, but the personal allowance, which is, the, whoops, which is that bigger 7170 figure, that is hit by the 1% cap. So her total income is actually only going up by 1.4%. So uh, whereas inflation, according to the measure, is 2.2%. So she's had a, a bit of a cut in, in real terms. She's, getting in, she's got less money to spend than last year. Universal credit coming along for carers, well, the big idea is, is to merge all of those means-tested benefits. It's going to be paid monthly in arrears. So again, this is of this bit about claimants having more responsibility. Uh, they're putting out leaflets now saying, what can I do to prepare for universal credit? Because there's a bit of a way off before it happens. Um, but what they're saying to people is, get yourself broadband and learn how to budget monthly. And a lot of people are brilliant budgeters, but they're robbing Peter to pay Paul to get through the week. And they're used to weekly money. Well, now they've got to get round monthly. And the idea is to make it more like in the world of work, because the majority of people in work get their salaries paid monthly. Although that's not true of the work that people moving off benefits go into. Lower paid work is still, lots of it is weekly. So. But anyway, uh, also the claim is going to be online. So you've got to learn to claim online. And if you haven't got broadband, yes, there will be. You can queue up at the job centre for the hour and a half it's going to take to fill in the form. And at the moment, you can't take a break from the form. So if you stop halfway or the computer goes, you have to start again. So that's not very... Hopefully they'll sort that out. There are basic amounts for adults and children. There's also extra amounts for limited capability for work. Um, there's nothing for adult disability, I'll come back to that. There's amounts for child disability and child care, carers and ha amounts for carers. So Miss Carer will get the same when she moves over to universal credit, she'll get whatever. She won't win or lose. But a, a new carer with disabilities, there isn't really a disability element at all, which is alarming for the people you look after. But if you're a carer with disabilities, um, you there is the only way of getting extra for disability is by actually passing the limited the, the test for ESA basically 
which isn't appropriate. A lot of people who have disabilities don't go through that test because they may be unemployed, they may be carers, um, they may be lone parents, they may actually be in full-time paid work. But the only way to access any extra money under universal credit is to go through the test of, which is to do with whether you can work or not. That's not a test of disability. Disability is separate from sickness. The government have either deliberately or by incompetence have lost, have missed the difference. So you're going to have people who are in full-time work having to go along to a medical to prove that they can't work at all in order to be able to get any extra, the extra money they would have had as a disabled worker. So, but, um, so the problem for carers, we'll come back to people, the problem for people with disabilities, the problem for carers is if you've got a disability, in as far as there is anything to be given <coughs> for your disability, it's, it's one or the other. Under the current system, if you're a carer with disabilities, you can get extra amounts for your disability and income support, and you can get extra amounts for being a carer. There's no contradiction. Just as there is no contradiction between having disability living allowance and having carer's allowance. But for disabled carers now, then, and often I've come across situations, often perhaps more with um, older people, but it happens a lot where you know, people with different difficulties, you know, say they've got one pair of legs and one pair of eyes between them or something, often put like that. Somebody may have physical difficulties and somebody may have uh, mental health difficulties. So the person with mental health difficulties can get down to the shop and buy things, but it's completely flummoxed. But the person with physical disabilities organises, writes the list and organises everything. <coughs> Whatever, you know, people help each other out. So it's, you, uh, there are a lot of situations where people are both having D DLA and entitled to carers. So what about the people who are affected by, with disabilities? How are we doing to, all oh, right. Um, um, I mean, if, as we go along, I realize I'm, I'm spouting away. Um, if there's any, we'll have some time for questions when I finish, but if there's any comments you want to make, just to liven it up. Uh, but again, please mind your language because the microphone will pick you up. <laughs> um, you know, if there's any sort of queries that go along, because otherwise you'll, it's, it's nice and warm in here and we're all going to fall asleep. When I fall asleep, I know it's, it's gone really bad. Um, so we are, any, any questions so far, sort of thing, it's sort of, but do stop me, you know, on the way. I might say, oh, there's something further on on that, or it might be, and then we can have a bit of an open all questions at the end as well, but don't, don't feel you've got to stay silent until I've shut up. <laughs> right, two migrations and an offer you can't refuse. These are the three big changes that are affecting uh, people, and people with illness, long-term illnesses or disabilities are likely to be affected by all three of the changes. Migration number one that you probably know and love already is the switch from the old incapacity benefit to employment support allowance. A third are failing the new tests. The DWP predicted that only, they, they told Parliament only 15% would fail. Um, a third are failing the new tests. That does not mean they're being found fit for work. I mean, this is an example of where I get cross with the government because the ministers are going, ooh, a third of people have been found fit for work. No, they haven't. They've been found not to pass a test where the goalposts have been moved. The previous test was already the toughest test in the developed world. And that's according to an independent think tank. You know, it was the toughest test of invalidity or incapacity. Um, so this is just they've moved the goalposts. These are not people who are fit for work. As any person who works in a job centre will tell you, they are alarmed by the people coming through the doors. Yes, there may be if some of the people have got, you know, with a lot of support from disabled employment officers and so on, might make it, you know, into work. Perhaps they'll be at the back of the queue during a, a big recession with all these heroin hearty, walking wounded, unemployed who've unfortunately lost their jobs, you know. But they, with support, they might do. But a lot of people, they're going, no, this isn't going to work. And what they're doing very quietly, because they can't do anything about it because they work for the DWP, is they're saying, look, appeal. You know, I'll do my best to try and keep things, keep the pressure off you, but you are going to have a terrible time under job seekers allowance because quite rightly in some ways there's a lot of pressure on the job seekers allowance to make sure you're properly looking for work. Well, if you've got all your health problems and disabilities, looking for work is yeah, doubly difficult. Over 40% actually are winning on appeal, and that's across the board. Most people, ca it's very difficult to get representation. Um, they don't keep separate statistics when people are represented. <coughs> 
but I, you know, I often ask people, I do training courses, things like that, or I meet people at gatherings, and how's it going with the ESA appeals? Lots of advisors, not in any boastful way, because it's fairly common, haven't yet lost an appeal. And others have lost one or two, because it's inevitable that they'll, they'll have a case. You know, unless they're cherry picking the cases, there'll be some which are a bit of a gray area. But it's probably running at more than 80% where, where people have a representative. But the government are cutting back on advice. So uh, that's where local authorities can make a difference. You know, the, the money available to citizens' advice bureaus, welfare rights advice, even citizens' advice bureau don't have the funding to represent people. The best they can do is give you a letter, which helps to take with you um, to some, uh, and take you through what your case is. That can be really helpful as well. Um, the migration to universal credit, that's number, migration number two, which is all those means-tested benefits. Sorry. You know, when you go to the ESA, you do get a drop in money when you wait to the appeal. Yeah, you yeah. Know, yeah. Um, you, you, lose, you lose a bit of the, of the ESA, but what you're down to is the basic job, job seekers allowance levels. So, um, but at least you don't have to do the signing on. It's, it's certainly no picnic waiting for your appeal, by, by all means. Yeah. Um, then we've got the migration to universal credit. Well, at least there won't be an assessment there. You won't have to go through, oh, will I pass the medical? Everyone will pass. Um, what will happen is they'll be transferred onto the new benefit. There will be what they call transitional protection. So if the new universal credit isn't actually about a cut, they're going to spend, they're going to aim to, well, the original intention was to spend quite a bit more than the current benefits. Um, but that's been cut back, which is why universal credit's got a lot more complicated than it used to be. It's been cut back um, to, um, to allow for that. Um, but it is overall, they're going to be winners and losers. But if you're a, a loser under, under the switch, if you get less under universal credit, you'll get the, what they call the protection, which means that you'll start your universal credit on your existing benefit rate. But over time, you won't get any increases until universal credit's caught up with you. So you, for some people, they could be stuck for 10 years without getting any annual increase. And then there's the invitation to PIP, more of which later. So employment support allowance, taking them one at a time. Um, this is how, ooh, this colour is not, it depends on, it works on some projectors and not on others, so I'm sorry about that. The basic, what you get on employment support allowance is this basic amount, which is 7170. Um, if you're on income related ESA, there may be extras on top of that. And then for um, new claimants, they, they wait 13 weeks while they're being assessed. But for existing people who are moving over, then what will, they'll be put into one of two groups. They'll either get the work related activity component. Um, which is worth £28.45, or they get the support component, which is intended for the most severely sick and disabled. And that's worth a little bit more, but the other key difference, uh, it automatically triggers some extra amounts in means-tested benefits, so the gap is actually bigger than the sort of £6 uh, shown on there. Um, it also means that you don't have to be doing things. With a work-related activity component, there is a condition attached to it. The deal on offer was you were paid this quicker than under the old system. Under the old system, you had to wait a year to get extra amounts. You got this amount after 13 weeks if you were a new claimant. But in order to keep it, you had to participate in not being a job seeker, but you had to look at possibilities for you moving into work. Uh, Yeah. So how does that work? Um, normally, there's a restriction on people who are students um, claiming lots of benefits. But if if your son is um, either long-term sick or getting disability living allowance, then they can access the system. Um, in terms of the work-related activity, it's supposed to be in a, by a joint agreement. So hopefully, common sense is used, and they recognise that actually doing the college work will improve his employment prospects. Um, that should be, that ought to be the case. The problem happening at the moment is that they're, incre they're ratcheting up what they're expecting people to do within this work-related activity component, and they're also going a bit wild with the sanctions regime. In the past, they've said, 
you know, they saw sanctions as an admission of failure on their part. They didn't really, they were there in the background as a threat, but they were, wasn't meant to be used. This government denies it, but I'm afraid the evidence has come out now that they are setting targets for increasing the level of sanctions, whether it's for unemployed people or people on employment support allowance. So the sanctions regime is getting a bit snap happy, and if somebody's got to meet their targets, um, people have have said sort of you know undercover reporters you know the the sort of face blacked out and the voice a different an actor's voice over overlay people who are working as personal advisors in job centres are saying that they're actually having to deliberately trip people up to make them have a sanction to meet their targets otherwise they get disciplined so that's what's going on in in sanctions world but the deal was if you didn't do your work-related activity, you wouldn't be cut off from money at all. What would happen is you'd, you'd get your work-related activity, you'd lose half of that um, for four, four weeks, and if you still didn't get the message and still didn't do whatever it was you were supposed to do, then you'd lose the other half. That was how it used to work. So that was, you know, that was your bonus for doing work-related activity. You were given the bonus without having to show anything, but after to keep it, you had to do the work-related activity. If you're in the support component, you don't have to do any of that. So what's happening with the migration? Um, well, it's still going on. It's not news, um, but it's still got another year to run before they've got everybody over. So April next year, they hope to have got everybody over to employment support allowance. As I mentioned, the failure rate is a lot higher. Um, you know, somebody's put something into the tea that the doctors drink and whatever. Um, they've gone a bit gung-ho. Um, the decision they're making is in two parts. One is, do you, do you carry on into employment support allowance at all? And if you do, which of those two groups are you going to get? Are you going to be work-related activity or are you going to be support? And of those refused ESA altogether, approximately the DWP reckoned half would switch over to job seekers and half would come off benefit altogether because they can't access benefit. Perhaps they might want to be a job seeker, but they won't get any benefit out of it because their partner's working, perhaps. So that's where they, the people are. On top of that, that lot was going to save, that was already in the pipeline. You know, this, this was from um, the plans for all of this were laid by the last government. But what came in in the budget is if you're on the, what they call the contributory employment support allowance, that's the non-means-tested one, the one that you would get regardless of whether your partner's working or not, based on your national insurance, what happens is if you're in the work-related activity group, the majority who are in that left-hand column, they are going to... Um, lose it after a year. You might stack up all the points in the world, pass all the medicals with flying colours. <laughs> no, I mean, that's pass is the wrong word for it, but you know, know what I mean. Um, but at the end of a year, if you're on the work-related activity, it finishes. Your options then are either to try and get yourself oops, into the support component, because the support component is not affected by this time limit, or the alternative is to apply for in income-related employment support allowance. The means-tested version is not affected by the time limit, regardless of which of those two you earn. But the, the, the non-means-tested contributory version, if you're in the, the majority of people who are in the work-related activity component get hit. Well, the government is saying, well, that doesn't matter because there's all, if they're really in desperate straits, there's income-related employment to pick you up. But I'll give you an example, a case I'm dealing with at the moment. Um, it's a couple. Um, one is working, the other you know, was on incapacity benefits, switched over to ESA, got into the work-related activity group, probably was the right group for her situ situation. He's on, not, you know, he's on minimum wage, so he's earning about £140 a week. She was bringing in around £90, £100 a week from her incapacity benefit. So losing that, which will be, you know, is a huge chunk of that household budget. So it's, it's going to bring a family who are not the poorest, but on the not quite so poor level, they're going to be... And because they're still above, you know, then income-related ESA will take account of his earnings. So they're not going to get any income-related ESA. The only possibility for them is to see if we can build a case for her to move into that support component and get past the time limit, and then she can hang on to a 90 quid. I 
I'm sure there's a case for it. It's certainly, um, to my mind, it's reneging on the national insurance deal. You know, I pay my national insurance stamps on the basis that should I be unfortunate enough to be struck ill long term, I, as long as I can satisfy them that I am genuinely ill by whatever tests are in place, then the deal it was that I would be covered indefinitely, and, or until such time as I got better, which obviously is what I would be wanting to do and get back to work. But if I was unfortunate enough to be laid low for two or three years, or permanently, then I'd have that as backup, um, and that's what we all pay our national insurance for. You know. There's some interesting challenges there, I can see. <laughs> it's, I, I'm not sure if anybody's actually mounting a sort of, you know, human rights case. I mean, I'm not especially, you know, uh, I've got some awareness of human rights activity in relation to benefits, because other benefits things have been taken up. But it's certainly one that's worth exploring. Um, and, you know, they're going to save, well, actually long term, it's going to be about 3,000 million. So they're going to save more from just forget the test, forget you know, any rationale that we're putting you through the test, we're just going to knock it on the head, cut your benefit, and we saved almost as much as we're going to save from putting everybody through the test and failing them. You know, it's um, the other change is affecting this conditionality, it's a horrible word, but it's the current buzzword, it's, it's, your, it's that bit I was talking about, the work-related activity component, you, ha you only get the money if you do the right things, you know, if you behave. Um, what they've done is in April 2011, they, one bit of welfare reform cranked up what was expected of people including um, now under the new government, the work programme, which is mainly about long-term unemployed, but employment support allowance people can be referred to the work programme, certain bits of it. And then December last year, the sanctions, instead of going back to there, what you stood to lose was that, your bone, which is fair enough, you know, it was sort of, this is the deal. You're getting this for good behaviour, and if you don't behave, you're going to lose it. What they've switched it to is you're going to be left with that, but this is the bit they're going to take away. So instead of affecting 2845, they're going to sanction, they're going to affect 7170. So, um, so w the weird thing is, it makes no sense apart from they want to make it the same as job seekers' allowance in readiness for universal credit. That's the only logic, because what you're left to live on is your bonus for good behaviour, <laughs> which, um, uh, which is 28.45 a week. They've taken away 71.70. And not only have they increased that hugely, the level, uh, the, the penalty, um, also, as I mentioned earlier, the likelihood of getting a sanction has increased because they're getting trigger happy. Um, but also, um, uh, if you, under the old system, as soon as you behaved, you got your money back. You know, it wasn't meant to be a punishment, it was just to remind you, ooh, shot across the bowels. We'll stop your money, and then, you know, it could last for as long as, it could last for ages, but if, if you lost it one week and you said, oops, sorry, I realised what I did wrong, I'll do whatever it is, um, then you get your money back straight away. Under the new system, just to know that Nanny's very cross with you, it's going to be an extra week for a first offence, an extra two weeks for a second offence, an extra four weeks. So you comply and you still might have to wait four weeks before you get your money back. And the money you're needing to get back is the basic money to live on. You're going to be stuffed with, um, stuck on trying to live on 28.45. So that's nasty. I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> Disability benefits and PIP, that's, I'm sure that's kind of a, a bigger worry for you. So, uh, um, Why, again, this is Sound of Music, raindrops on roses and whiskers on kittens. Yep. <laughs> okay. um, why are they basically such important benefits for, uh, for us? Because they're payable in or out of work. They're not means tested in any way. They're paid on top of any other income. They never mean a cut in any other benefit. They could actually help you get more benefit through means tested uh, extra elements. They entitle carers, you know, you need it for carers allowance. And that when you get the money, although you have to fill in all the forms, and I don't need to tell you about those, um, you, um, 
what you spend the money on is entirely up to you. I did once have to sort of take a social worker aside when she was congratulating one of her clients on getting the benefit and said, now you must keep in a book everything you spend the DLA on for your child to make sure it's to do with disabilities. Uh, no, you know, the idea is that by helping the whole family budget, that is going to help, you know, that people are grown ups and can make the decisions that's right with the extra money. So PIP will do all of those things. So at least that's good news because there was some doubt. You know, PIP will take the same place as DLA in the benefit system. When's it happening? Well, for new claims, um, we're free of it for the moment, but on June the 10th, any person making a claim, trying to make a claim for DLA for the first time, uh, will be given a PIP form instead. Um, attendance allowance will carry on for new claims made after the age of 65. Can I, can I just Sorry. Uh, people, I know people that are already getting this PIP um, questionnaire tool. Right. There's a, in, in Wales, in West Wales actually. Right, that's... So, uh, yeah, they already had it and it was about um, months ago. Well, that they were on DLE. Well, they are on, they are on DLA, they have the question Very strange, um, because the process um, for existing DLA claimants isn't supposed to kick in, even start until October this year. What may be happening is, I think, um, my wife's on DLA, but she's had a, the same question. Oh, right. I think it's the ESA question. Ah, uh, right. Income, the, well, income. Uh, yes, eh, um, the old benefit, capacity benefit. Yeah. Know, yeah. So it may be that. Because, uh, that, that could, because that's she still going on. Yeah. You know, on DLA, we yeah. have this questionnaire that suddenly pops right. up. Yeah. And I think it's confusing a lot of people, actually. So yeah. I mean, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be a PIP questionnaire. If it is an ESA questionnaire, that would, but if, you, if it's a PIP okay. one. Yeah. Right. Um, in that case, something's gone very wrong. They shouldn't. Um, well, it's worth, um, you know, it shouldn't be happy, basically. It should be, what's this PIP questionnaire? This isn't due until October. Um, so, in, for new claims, it's only from June the 10th. After, after June, there are no new DLA claims for 16 to 64-year-olds. Existing people on DLA over, who've gone through the age of 65, what happens under DLA is if you claim it before you're 65, you don't lose it and switch to attendance allowance. You carry on with your DLA through your 65th birthday. Well, if you've, got, if you've been clever enough and wise enough to make sure that you pass 65 before this April, then you won't be affected by PIP. If you've, if you've been foolish enough to only be 65 in uh, this May, then at some point Pip will come knocking on your door. I know of a family where um, the, the female is under 65 and the man is under 65 and she's had a letter confirming that she will continue with the DLA until death. And she's not going to be reassessed for Pip. And she's under 65? she's under 65. Um, well, that's that again. You know, technically is wrong. Um, I mean, they might, they could come to when when Pip came round to her, they could come to that decision. Um, but as part of, yeah, no. They've said they are not going to assess her. Right. Well, hang on to that piece of paper because they might realise their mistake. And they say, I've got this personally signed by Mr. Ian Duncan Smith himself. You know, <laughs> in his name. You know. Um, so uh, the idea is there'll be no new DLA claims. The only, only DLA forms that will get filled in for new people after June will be for people whose awards come to an end, um, but the award is coming to an end before um, next February. So if, if your DLA is expected to come to an end in, let's say, September this year, normally you'd be sent out a new form, you know, those of you that have got um, getting DLA on a short-term basis about six months beforehand, they send you a new claim to claim again. That will carry on up until the, the, the forms they send out in October, which are going to be for people whose claim is due to end in February. The other group will be um, young people who are turning 16, who, um, again, and if they're turning 16 before October the 8th, they will get a DLA form. 
and they'll be processed as DLA. PIP will come to them eventually, but they'll be DLA for now. But those, will be the, that, those small exceptions will be the only people who are going to be putting in DLA forms after, uh, for new claims. What, what about the lifetime awards and the It's not, it doesn't, doesn't mean a thing. We'll have a look at the migration process in a moment. Um, that starts in October. The invitation to claim process starts for existing claimants. Um, so it's, there are two dates, and then I'll, I'll come into the detail of what you can expect to happen. Um, from, the, from this October, they're not going to open it up to everybody. They're not going to start going through everybody who's on DLA this October. What they're going to do is people whose DLA is coming to an end but it's coming to an end uh, from 1st of March next year, um, will, instead of having a DLA form, will have to apply for PIP. Anyone who's seeking a change in their DLA, you know, perhaps they think they've got worse and they would want to apply for a higher rate, you know, they were quite happy with the DLA that they were awarded, but things have changed and now perhaps they should be getting a higher rate. Well, after October, that is instead of going to be applying for change my DLA, it's going to be apply for PIP and be assessed under PIP. Um, young people reaching 16 after the age of, uh, after 7th of October, and self-selectors, that isn't a sort of uh, new sort of band hitting a beat combo, um, the self-selectors, uh, it's people who actually want to volunteer and go in early and get, get the, either because they just want to get the whole thing over with, they can't stand the waiting, or there will be winners under PIP. Some people will get more out of the PIP system than that, although the overall thing is a 20% cut, there'll be some people who gain, as, who, who might gain, as, a, as well as lots of people who will lose. Um, and then from October 2015, that's when they just go through everybody, you know, at random, um, they'll pick people out between 2015 and 2017. They will receive their invitation to claim PIP. Let me ask then how that affects those um, families that are affected with children who are limiting, um, on life-limiting illnesses. How, how is that going to work? Well, children are exempt. You know, under 16s are exempt anyway. If um, if they pass 16, you know, it's a younger. You, you know, young person um, and they're you know if special rules would apply then the special rules system applies to PIP as well so the say someone's coming up to their 16th birthday yeah they haven't thought of that um, well, they're coming up to 16, they would, they would um, depending when they turn 16, if they turn 16 before October, they would be asked to do a new DLA claim it's anyway. Special. It's... it's well, they're, they're just going to put them through a PIP process. If it's, if it's before, if, if they turn 16 before October, then it, DLA, technically DLA would be a new application, but they would probably just continue the award um, anyway. They wouldn't make somebody go through the whole malarkey because, well, the, the malarkey for somebody who was special rules is just ticking the box and putting in a certificate, and then, boom, it would be a three-year award, and every three years you'd have to do that if you are... Um, are on special rules, and the same is going to happen under PIP. Um, but if they if it's six, if they turn 16 after October, technically it's going to be a PIP application. But again, it should be easy application based on the special rules. And actually, the form filling for the way they've done it is all the information they need to make an award for special rules. This is one of the improvements under PIP. Is in the one early short form, whereas at the moment you the issues to do with mobility you have to do on the main part of the form whereas you don't have to do the full questionnaire you don't have to wait for the full questionnaire in the PIP process it's all dealt with in the in the initial claim um, and then everyone else gets put through how much will it be dum 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 oh, right sorry the, the different Different s slides and projectors sort of don't talk to each other too well. These were in a nicely lined up. This is the DLA rates that we know and love. So you've got three rates. The bottom one's dropped off. The bottom, the £21 rate for lowest care. And we'll, there was all kinds of fevered speculation. What will be the PIP rates? Because they weren't telling anybody. Because once they put money on it, people get grumpy. <laughs> and what they did was exactly the same. So enhanced mobility is 55.25, same as high mobility. Standard mobility is the same as low mobility. 
enhanced daily living is the same as highest care and standard daily living is the same as middle care. What there isn't under PIP is a lowest care. There isn't an equivalent to DLA lowest care, the £21 care. That doesn't exist under PIP. You've got to make it to the £53 or you don't get anything. And that could be good or bad news, depending on how you do under the PIP system. So is PIP all about a very fancy, dressed up, expensive way of getting rid of everybody who's on the lowest rates and the rest of us can forget about it? Unfortunately, no. Because these are the winners and losers. Only about 16% are going to stay the same. As, you know, even though the rates are the same, only about 16% are going to get exactly the same money as they had under DLA. 29%, the good news is, are actually going to get more under PIP than they would under DLA. But then 29%, an equal number, will stay on PIP, but they will get less than they would have done under DLA. And 26% are just going to lose their PIP altogether, and that's where they're going to make the saving. That and the people going down. But very few people are staying the same. So although when you first look at the rates, you think, OK, I'm on lower mobility middle care, or for example, I don't need to worry about it because it's, it's really aimed at the lowest care people. It isn't. There were, I won't put up the statistics, uh, but they, they've done measures of what it's going to look like. There were large number, about 400,000 people expected to lose their, the equivalent of higher rate mobility now and drop down to the standard rate of mobility. These, uh, these are the people that are in that virtually unable to walk category. If you can walk about you know, up to 50 yards, what they're doing is they're moving the goalposts back to 20 yards. So if you can, then you'll carry on. But if you're in that group who sort of get it under 50 yards, they may still get the mobility, but they're dropped down to the £21 rate. And motability expecting about a third of the fleet back as a result. What's the sort of difference? Uh, the, sorry, this is really uh, unfortunate. You know, it's just gone. This is a rundown. These are the bits that you know very well. It's my attempt to summarise DLA in, in 30 seconds. So you've got the higher mobility is to do with whether you can walk or not. Um, or whether you've got whether you're virtually unable to walk, or there's various other you know uh, they've recently introduced if you're registered blind you'll get a higher rate, or certain severe learning disabilities, um, various other things like if you if you don't have feet you automatically get the higher rate mobility various things like that. Lower mobility is almost like a separate thing um, of its own, um, which isn't to do with your physical walking ability. It's about whether or not you can uh, need somebody with you in an unfamiliar place. And that might be due to sensory problems. It might be hearing. It might be um, mental health, learning difficulties, all of that sort of thing. And you can get some odd, you know, you can see where the, why they, it's historic, but they're totally separate. So you could have someone who, yes, perhaps has to use a wheelchair, but has got really good, you know, is a Paralympic athlete sort of type, you know, has, has got full use in upper strength. And yes, there will always be the restrictions on the, on the um, uh, and difficulties of being a wheelchair user and accessing buildings and so on. But their effective mobility might be more than someone who's got such severe learning difficulties and mental health problems that they can hardly go out the house unless, you know, cajoled, dragged, bribed and everything. But the, the person with the, who perhaps is more restricted can only ever get the lower mobility. Now, the, those people could be winners under PIP. Um, we'll come back to that. Care is then to do with how much help you need from a carer, really. If it's day and night, it's highest care. If it's just daytime, or in a few cases just nighttime, it's middle care. If it's just a little bit of the day, it's, it's lowest care. That's dropped off the bottom. Under PIP, it's just points make prizes. So enhanced mobility, you get the enhanced mobility if you get 12 or more points from the two m mobility areas, two mobility activities. The two mobility activities broadly include everything that's in these two. So that means that somebody who's that extreme situation, I was mentioning somebody with mental health issues that can hardly, or learn difficulties, who can hardly get anywhere even in places they know well, if they can't do it in places they know well, then that's t they'll get 12 points from that activity and they would actually get the higher rate, the equivalent of the higher rate. For the first time, they would get access to the higher rate. On the downside, 400,000 people currently on the higher rate will be assessed as, yes, you've got walking problems, but not 
walking problems high enough, you've only scored eight points, you will get the standard rate. So that's an example of winners and losers. And it's exactly the same for enhanced daily living. There are 10 daily living activities, and if your total is more than 12, you'll get the enhanced daily living. And if it's 8 to 11, you get the standard daily living. And it doesn't matter whether day and night is irrelevant now. So there could be some winners or losers out of it. Uh, somebody who's on the um, uh, uh, day... Um, uh, you know, who's, who has loads of needs during the day but sleeps quite well through the night, technically can only ever get the middle rate. But uh, under PIP, they might score 12 points and get the, get the higher rate. Similarly, somebody who hasn't got huge amounts of needs but they are spread, they do happen some in the day, some in the night, who gets the highest rate may find that they don't score the 12 points and drop down. So both are going to happen in large numbers. These are these activities, <laughs> sorry, um, uh, the slides that you'll get a copy of will have these lined up, so two of them are dropped off the bottom, but they're kind of, some of them are familiar from DLA, you know, it's, so daily living is preparing food, taking nutrition, managing therapy, washing, bathing, managing toilet needs, dressing and undressing, communicating verbally, reading and understanding signs, symbols and words, and the two that dropped off the bottom are engaging socially with others and making financial decisions. So some people will actually do quite well. I mean, not that they're not covered by DLA, but it can be hard to get, uh, get your head around. Um, That's really interesting for autism. Yeah. Because, um, with autism, you can do some of those things in some places, mm. but not all those places. Yeah. So it's very sort of hit and miss. So, for example, my own child might like, be able to prepare food at school, but you couldn't do that at home. Yeah. So he doesn't transfer the learning from one setting to another. Yeah. It's quite interesting. So, I mean, some, uh, you know, there was a team um, who work, um, some colleagues in Durham, you know, all of us in the advice industry, as it were, be going, God, Pip, <laughs> you know, because we know there's going to be loads of appeals, you know, we're gonna, it's going to be ESA all over again. And they were sitting around gloom and said, OK, let's have a look at this point system. And they were actually a, a couple of people who were working with learning difficulties. And they were actually looking at the point system, trying to apply it to their clients and thinking, actually, although we can get these taken into account for DLA, it's almost like you have to argue to your blue in the face because it's, it's not the obvious traditional difficulties. So you, you can get your communication in with DLA, but you really got to argue with DLA about it. Whereas now it's up front on the test, points there to be scored. So for learning difficulties, there's good news. Potentially people with sight and sensory impairment, there's good news because of the um, verbally and the reading and understanding symbols. Communi so somebody with autism might gain from the communication verbally, they might gain from the um, making financial decisions, they might gain from the in engaging socially. And just in those areas could easily get quite a few points. You know. I know you're saying about um, blindness. So are the forms going to be accessible because the current DLA forms are not? Um, well, they're, they're slightly better. They are making, because we're moaning so much and they're trying to consult with the disability lobby, which is why the test has improved and changed, um, some of the things that we moan about on DLA forms have improved. They're still long forms, um, but they're a bit clearer. Um, and they're also... Also, if you've got um, somebody who uses JAWS, you know what Jaws is a reader on the computer oh, yeah. for a yeah. person. person. Yeah. Will they be able to make their own application or are they still going to need to have some form for them, which takes away the... They're, I mean, they're talking that they haven't got online forms at the moment, um, whether they will have online forms. It's the sort of thing that they <laughs> would be willing to consider because they want to be ever so nice and friendly. They're busy yeah, saying... Yeah, that, well, yeah, yeah, there's that. <laughs> yeah, they're, um, but they're, they're, they're willing to listen to those points. Um, whereas um, people, um, because they want to take pe money off people, but they want to do it in a nice and friendly way. They're saying this not, even Atos are saying we're not, we're not going to do it like ESA. And the people that are going to be doing the PIP assessments in Wales is a different outfit. There's th three 
um, different groups, uh, three different contracts. Atos have got two of them for southern Britain and north of England and Scotland. Wales and the central part of England is by this other outfit called Capita that is run by the chief executive of whom is, um, of which is a person with disabilities. They are promising to be, we are not Atos, they're promising to do home visits rather than haul people into centres. You can't even get rail copies of it will be interesting to see because they've been given, they've been given a kind of blank, you know, black box contract to run the system, um, and uh, they will be judged on things like that. So I think that initially they'll be sensitive to, so make the request and see what happens. Tom, can I bring you Michelle? Yeah. Um, I actually went to. I mean, I'm, I'm actually in the right group. Uh, I actually went to the job centre. Um, so I think it was March last year, or March this year. Yeah. Um, well, on both occasions, I was told there was no large print. No large yeah. print documents. Yeah. So I just said to them, well, you know, the point is going to be that. Yeah. Because I can't seem to read. Yeah. My long distance is okay. But anything close up. I mean, local offices just don't have the stuff. They're probably, you know, part of it is they're not doing stuff, and part of it is that local offices aren't aware of what stuff has been done. Um, and that, um, and so, and it's, it's a kind of, I mean, we're talking, uh, you know, Pip, sorry, I'll, t I'll turn, it's me beeping. Sorry about that. Um, I should have said at the beginning, everybody turn off their mobile phones, <laughs> especially me. <laughs> so at least nobody's tried to ring me up. Um, yeah, I mean, ESA's got a load of criticisms of its own. Um, it's just, I suppose, the distinction they're trying to make with this new PIP is that they're going to try and do a lot better than the ESA. Well, fine, why not do better with the ESA while you're doing it? No, <laughs> surely this should have been on file. Yeah. 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 But it's, it's kind of... More and more, you know, as things are getting pushed into, the, as well as all these cuts to their benefits, they're cutting back on the system as well. So the individual, you know, people that kind of were responsible for your case and knew and put, you know, the old fashioned uh, advisor in um, offices is less, um, you know, who's actually involved in the processing it doesn't happen anymore. There isn't anybody in, in command, well, in it's the Netley Centre or whatever, but um, everything has been done remotely. You know, people in Swansea, their benefits processed in Wrexham, you know. Um, there's nobody there who knows about them. Increasingly, it's all going to be sort of computer decisions and all of that malarkey. So um, um, it's going to, we're going to lose a lot of that experience and common sense as older people, are lo uh, the older and more experienced staff are just getting the heck out of there. Uh, so, what does PIP do with other benefits? Um, you know, that's a, you, you can go into the detail, but there are, as I say, winners and losers on the point system. So, I'm just trying to put a silver lining to the cloud. The assessment process um, is, is going to involve um, uh, a bit like an ESA thing. So, there'll be a short form. All the invitation is is an invitation to make a new claim for PIP, and after that, apart from the invitation process, you will get. Um, exactly the same treatment as a new claimant. So you'll get an initial form to fill in. They would like you to phone up, as with ESA. They would prefer you to do that initial claim over the phone. And then after that, you'll be sent a questionnaire, just in the same way as you'll send a questionnaire for employment support allowance. You'll get a questionnaire for PIP, how your disability affects you. They will consider that, any other evidence you send in, and then decide, in most cases, they'll want you to go to a medical. So in that sense, it's exactly the same as PIP. On the other hand, they're promising that it won't feel like ESA. Sorry, it's exactly the same as ESA, but they're saying that it won't feel like that. Um, for carers, basically either rate of the PIP daily living component, um, because that's basically the PIP is, is middle or highest care, there is no lowest care. So any rate of PIP daily living will entitle a carer to claim carer's allowance. Carers uh, with disabilities can still claim both, but as I mentioned before, they're not going to be able to get both rewarded under universal credit, but they'll still be able to have PIP on top of DLA. 
and then the, the other passported benefits will be the same as DLA. So it's motor mobility, you'll need the enhanced rate. So that's why a lot of mobility cars are going to go back after the once PIP's done its thing. Um, PIP will act just like DLA for the current means tested benefits. So, you know, any rate of PIP will get you a disability premium or disabled work element. Please ignore me if you don't know what those mean. I won't go into I won't try and explain severe disability premium. I've gone on far too long. Um, but all of the exactly the same things now um, will happen. Um, one slight improvement is that there's a thing called non-dependent deductions from your housing benefit um, if you've got another adult living with you. Um, and at the moment, certain rates of DLA, basically the care, any rate of the care component, will exempt you. Under PIP, it doesn't matter whether it's care or mobility, that will exempt, exempt you. So that's an improvement there. Of course, with universal credit, we don't know when the time's going to happen um, for the migration to start. Um, there's no clear date because it's a huge IT task and a government minister made the mistake of saying the IT is bang on schedule and not only have they got to get the computer working in the DWP but they've got to hitch it up to a new computer in HMRC and the tax people because the idea is that when somebody changes earnings, the computer in the Inland Revenue will automatically report it to the computer in the DWP, which will automatically readjust somebody's universal credit if they're working. Wonderfully seamless and um, just like tax credits then. <laughs> so uh, for anyone that's... There's no new assessments, so it's just random moving over. I don't mean... It just means your time will come. You know, it's at, you'll be picked out at random. You'll be processed over. Um, you get this transitional protection that I've already mentioned. But transitional protection can be lost. So if you split up or get together with a partner, then you're making a new universal credit claim. Goodbye transitional protection. You will get whatever the rate for universal credit in your new circumstances is. If there's a break in your claim, if you cease employment, so perhaps you're on working tax credit, you get transitional protection as you move into universal credit. You stop working, goodbye goes, goes your... Um, or if your earnings fall below conditionality level, that's a techie one, but it's there. So there are, there are reasons your transitional protection isn't firm and guaranteed forever and a day. The other thing that particularly affects, uh, as I mentioned before, there are standard allowances plus the amounts for childcare, amounts for carers, amounts for housing costs, and amounts for limited capability for work, which is equivalent to the work-related activity component under ESA and limited capability for work-related activity, because this is benefit simplification. We used to say support group, now it'll be limited capability for work-related activity element, because that's much easier to say. Um, so it's one or the two. The, the limited capability for work element will be exactly the same in cost. The test will be exactly the same. The works. You won't have to go through a new uh, assessment because your ESA assessment carries through into universal credit. The difference between the two is the limited capability for work-related activity element is actually going to pay a lot more than the support component. It's going to be about 70 quid a week. And what they're saying is that's going to roll in things like the severe disability premium and the enhanced disability premium is all rolled into a new, much higher work-related activity element. Fine, except there will be some people who, don't, who won't get support group, who won't be in the work-related work activity element, but will quite rightly be in the limited capability for work element, but at the moment, because of their DLA, they can get the severe disability premium, things like that. They will lose that. They won't be able to get that, because they, the only way to get the equivalent, get some of that money back, is to get yourself into the equivalent of the support group. So there's money lost there. The original plan was to simplify the disability elements. Right, we're only going to have two tiers, they said. Fair enough. Instead of this complicated, you know, three different... Uh, in, Disability premium, enhanced disability premium, severe disability premium. I bet nobody in the room could necessarily get up, including me, and 100% say exactly what the difference between them is. Um, I'd have a go. But <laughs> um, so they're going to simplify it, fine. And what they, they were going to say was they're going to line it up to the rates for these limited capability for work. And that's what they've done with children. 
So if you get, at the moment, if you get any rate of DLA as a child, then you will qualify for the equivalent amount as the limited capability for work element. And if you get the highest rate of care as a child, you will qualify for the equivalent amount of the work-related activity component. The big change, though, is that the majority of children who are not on the highest care will get a drop because the, by lining up with the, basically with the ESA components, by lining up the rates, then instead of £56.45, which is what you get under child tax credit for a disabled child, you'll get £28.45, the equivalent of work-related activity component. So this government talks about protecting the most vulnerable, and it's hard to imagine who is more vulnerable than a child with long-term disabilities in a low-income household, because it's only affected, you know, the higher-income households are not affected by this. It's the ones that need the, the money most. I rest my case, Your Honour. Um, the, the problem, the logic would be, why not do the same for children? OK, it's unfair on, on, on most children, but at least why not carry that through for adults? And if you get any rate of PIP or DLA, have the limited capability for work element without having to go through the test. You may have all gone through the test already anyway, and that's not a problem. But why you especially have to go through the test when it could be a problem? Um, and if you get the highest rate, get into the work-related activity component. They aren't doing that. They're saying what they want is a common gateway. In other words, via the work capability assessment. That's the, that's the posh name for the test for employment support allowance. That's not changing. That carries on as before. So the, um, what that leaves is a huge gap. Yes, a lot of people, and a lot of people you care for will have gone through that test anyway. So in that sense, it's not a problem. It's just whether they win or lose money. They'll, they'll get something extra. But there'll be lots of people with disabilities who are not necessarily unfit for work. It's measuring two very different things. You know, you can be, uh, you know, uh, you know, well, at one point, the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions was a David Blunkett. He was blind, you know, registered, potentially registered disabled. I don't know if he claimed his DLA, but he would be entitled to it. Um, carers, lone parents, job seekers, you know, lots of people with disabilities. I mean, it depends on the disability, you know, whether you're able to do that. But if, you know, lots of people want to and are able to go job seeking as long as they can find employers doing reasonable adaptions, their particular illness or disability might not stop them actively seeking work. Therefore, they shouldn't be able to pass a work capability assessment because that's about you can't work. But they would have to go through a work capability assessment to, to get any of this extra money under universal credit, any of the extra money they currently get under the, <laughs> under the existing system. 16% um, of DLA claimants are actually in full-time work. Um, they are doing it, interestingly, for mixed-age older couples. What on earth is a mixed-age older couple? That's basically if you've got a trophy bride or gigolo in your wardrobe. Um, it's, a, it's a new version of bedroom tax here. <laughs> If, if one of you is over pension age, I know that's moving, so I'm not going to say an age, you know, but let's say in the future, come the glorious, the, the brave new world of welfare reform, it will be 65. So one of you is over 65, one of you is under 65. At the moment, it's the oldest person can claim pension credit. Under the new system, when there's somebody under 65, they won't be able to claim pension credit. They will have to go on to universal credit. Now, at the moment, there's a choice. You know, if the older person wants to be the claimant, they will get pension credit. They won't have any of the hassles of working age benefits. If the younger person has a hobby and particularly likes filling in forms and, and or has a crush on their personal advisor down the job centre <laughs> and really wants to be an ESA claimant when they don't have to, there's nothing to stop them doing that and they will get the same amount of money because ESA will give them a pensioner premium which will bring them up to pension credit rates. So it's a kind of choice of preference and circumstances and whatever. The couple have a choice. There is no choice under the new system. They will have to claim universal credit. Universal credit does not have an amount for um, pensioners in it. There's no pensioner premium. So there's an immediate 100 quid loss there. Also, they're going to lose out on things like severe disability premium because there won't be a severe disability premium in universal credit. Except 
for mixed age older couples, they're doing what I said they ought to be doing for everybody, which is allowing PIP or DLA to qualify you for the limited capability for work tests and the limited capability for work related activity. <laughs> um, they allow you to do that. Um, on the basis of your DLA and PIP without having to go through a medical under the work capability assessment. So why not do that for everybody? You're doing it for, for mixed age older couples, you're doing it for the children. There's rough justice involved. There will be winners and losers out of that change. It is a simpler system. Carry the logic through and let's have the 16 to 64 year olds in there as well. It's about time I shut up, so I will. Thank you very much. Any sort of questions about any of this, or have you had quite enough and like to do something else? Yes. If the if the if the side is a result of putting in that questionnaire and then you need to take take the place. Um it, it, uh, if as a uh, when the you fill in the ESA questionnaire yeah. and or an interview possibly and the ESA is taken away from you, well, then you go down to uh, the job seekers allowance in the interim as this was saying. Yeah. What happens to the DLA? DLA shouldn't, shouldn't be affected. Well, you could actually technically be taken off the ESA, but retain your DLA. Could be. Yeah. Okay. Um, there is a crossover in that, I mean, I've got a situation, it's not quite the same because um, somebody who'd been taken off their ESA, and they shouldn't have been, and actually they've been put back on it, but we've had a decision letter saying we've changed our minds, but irritatingly they haven't told us what they've changed their minds to. We know he's getting his benefit back because otherwise they won't have changed their minds. We don't know which rate he's on or what points they've given. And the reason why it's particularly irritating is because they, we also, as part of that, I picked up that he wasn't getting his DLA, so we put in an application, sent in the supporting evidence that we got for the ESA anyway, because as we'd had it. Um, but they picked up on the ESA form and they used that to turn him down for DLA. So there is a crossover. Um, they're entitled to do that but they've got to be very careful, or they ought to be very careful, using evidence obtained for one benefit when well, that's for another. Concern. Yeah. When you were talking, or what we were doing, I was thinking, you know, you've got the, the, the separate systems, aren't they? Yeah. But there, there's a crossover there. You know, the worry of people, because a lot of people don't get these ESA questionnaires coming through, you yeah. know, from the policy uh, uh, capacity benefit and the other, so the yeah. end of the yeah. And uh, the, 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 you know, the thing is, if you fail the capacity for benefits um, as assessment through the questionnaire that you're filling all over, then I mean, this is the DNA going to be taken away as well. And this, the, this it shouldn't be it. automatic, but it, it's potential. Yeah. You can't say 100%. Um, and if the, if the um, ESA is particularly strikingly, there's nothing wrong with you, and it throws up some doubt, you know, particularly the one bit where there is quite a close overlap is mobility, yeah. because yeah. The, the test is very similar. Yeah. Um, well, if, if they were saying, well, actually, you're, you say you're on DLA um, higher mobility, but in the opinion of the ESA doctor, you could walk 400 yards with but a minor twinge, you know. Um, they might, somebody at ESA might think, hold on, that doesn't fit, I'll send that report. They might actively send the report over to DLA and up to DLA what they want to do about it. DLA shouldn't sort of pull the trigger and sort of stop the DLA. What they should do is consider, based on other evidence they've got, do they think it would be um, worth, that, that there's a case to reopen the DLA. Um, what they've said under PIP, interesting enough, is that there's a lot of argument about them using these reports in DLA, and I've, I've just done this because I'm with, with the DLA tribunal, I'm sort of saying, huh, you shouldn't be using ESA, and by the way, ESA have actually, because they've agreed to change their minds, they've rejected the ESA report, so you're using a report for another benefit that's been rejected by the department, so, um, you know. I've got all my braces going here, Perry Mason and another thing. Um, but um, what they promised for PIP, even though actually the case is probably, there's more of a case for using ESA and PIP because they're both point systems. There's more of an overlap maybe, but they're saying specifically they have promised that the minister has announced they are not going to use ESA papers for PIP and vice versa. So why are you doing it for DLA? <laughs> Still, sorry. If um, if you get turned down for DLA, 
and you go to appeal. Do you lose your DLA? While you're waiting for appeal, yeah. For DLA, you would. You would. Yeah. What's, what's going to happen from October, well, with PIP from the start and for all benefits from October, the government is saying that rather than go straight to an appeal, um, it used to be that actually the case with DLA that you had to go for what they call a revision, which is the department looking at it again. And there's swings and roundabouts because actually if the revision's done properly, um, then it could mean that it's done a lot more quickly. And some people actually choose to, to go through two stages because it gives them two bites at the cherry, as it were. Um, uh, and because they hate the idea of going to a tribunal and they'd rather do it, you know. Um, so, you know, the whole thing might end up just being more drawn out. But some people, especially when there's some good extra evidence, that can swing the DWP's mind. Um, whereas... Um, you don't need necessarily as heavy evidence to get an appeal to. Not that the appeals give out money for, um, as, I, as I well know from appearing in, in front of appeals, but they, because they actually see the person for the first time, that's why appeals are, are better. When you're getting in applications for uh, I quite like to be proactive in how I do that. And so some of the ways that I've managed to get no appeals is to actually put additional information yeah. in. Um, about what they're asking for yeah. at the time I put the form in yeah. and that seems to really help yeah. not going to appeal. Yeah. <laughs> And, and the, there is some pressure at last on the DWP. They used to be very trigger happy if you asked them to look at it again. Well, even if you didn't ask them to look at it again, they'd always would look at it because they decide whether they would go for the bother of putting all the paperwork together for the appeal. Um, but what they've done is they've they, they used to never change their minds, but now they're increasingly doing it because the tribunal service are getting fed up with being sent cases which should never have got to the appeal anyway and wasting everybody's time. I'm a parent carer, so I would put in, say, my child's statement. Obviously, I know that's yeah. changing now as well, but yeah. I would put in my child's statement or the most recent statement to go in and then they can double-check with the school that that's all of yeah. the story. And the PIP wording actually encourages you to put, for example, another improvement, encourages you to put in extra evidence. It, it says, you know, don't hang around because you need to get this form back, but if you have some evidence, by all means, bang it in. S sorry. Um, I had a autistic daughter, and I was advised not to appeal because I could lose my higher age care if I appealed against the lower age disability mobility. Right. There is always a danger, and they make a point, it's a bit like stocks and shares, you know, the sort of money, you know, they can go up as well as down. Um, you can, under current rules, just ask for the mobility to be looked at again, but there is nothing to stop them if any evidence comes up to throw any question on the care to reopen the care. They've awarded you higher care for a reason. Yeah. Why do they change your mind? Because, because the care component doesn't change. No, but it, from your point of view, you're saying there's a change in the mobility situation. It has been, but it's they got it wrong last year. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I th what I would do if I was, you know, working with you as an advisor is, yes, there, you know, we go through it. Yes, there's a risk. Let's look at the whole case. What we're going to do is just ask them about the mobility, but let's look at the um, case for the higher rate care. Is there any, you know? Is it very clear cut and strong and no risk? Or is, is there a potential risk? What can we do about that risk if there is one? Um, can we get you know, an extra bit of supporting evidence to cover it? But what we would ask for is just the mobility to be looked at. We would say on the way, nothing's changed as far as the care is concerned. What, the reason why we're looking at the, the mobility is because not because anything's really changed, it's because you got it wrong originally. And we go through that case, and then when we put the whole picture together, then in the end of the day, only you can decide with the informed advice of somebody advising you, right, with this evidence, your care's looking really solid. I can't, cannot give you a 100% guarantee, but that, there's lots of evidence and reasons why higher care applies. It's not one of those grey area ones. And the case for mobility is very clear cut, and this is what we're going to do. We're just going to ask them to look at mobility. We're going to expressly say there is nothing changing as far as the care is concerned. Um, do you want to go ahead? And at the end of the day, only you can make the decision. But what happens when you ring up the DLA is they, they give you that warning straight away. You know, your money could go down as well as up. 
partly, you know, and tribunals will say that as well, but often, you know, tribunals will apply common sense and they will give that warning, but then they will say, um, I mean, I once sat in a tribunal where we're trying to get more money, the case wasn't going very well, and in the end, the person actually was sort of, they were getting the lower rate care for cooking and um, they were sort of the evidence they were giving verbally was actually suggesting that they could actually could manage a main meal so what we ended up doing was the victory at the tribunal was we spent all our effort there's another way of getting a lower care so we're arguing about that and the tribunal accepted that so the grand decision was they left with exactly the same money but for a different reason so you know it's it's something to go in with your eyes open but don't give up on the idea it's, but the important thing is when you have got some DLA or some PIP is to check out before you go into it uh, as to where, where the case is going to be and have that advice and support uh, to get you through that. Um, and then the chances could be very, you know, it could be that an advisor could say yeah, there's a really strong case here and I can't give you a 100% guarantee but the care looks very safe. There's no real reason. They need a reason to look at it again. They can't just go, oh, we want to look at it again. They need, then there has to be something that crops up that throws doubt on the care if all we've asked them to do is look at the mobility. But it could come up and it could come up just in somebody saying something out of place in an appeal hearing and that can open up, which is, you know, that was my completely different benefit, but a, a different rate than the example I had when I was sort of doing a rear guard action to, to save the benefit we came in with. But we managed that, but unfortunately. But that was because the case was a bit of a grey one. They were only going in with the lowest care. There wasn't so much to lose or whatever. I would, wouldn't have necessarily t advised that person to go ahead when there was that much more to be lost, as in your case. Does it fix the additional yeah. And that's why I was advised not to appeal. Yeah. I um, was that you know you've gone through that in detail with an advisor, or was that the DWP, the department mm -hmm. Sorry. Project family. Oh, okay. Project family. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. no. I, you know, you, there's no one to go. Yeah. You know, there, there is a massive shortage of advice and one of the things I'm hoping the councillors in Carmarthenshire are getting quite interested in the whole welfare reform because it is going to impact you know, there's research just been released, it isn't surprising, but at least gives the statistics that the areas most affected by welfare reform are the areas with the highest deprivation because health goes with deprivation, you know, the eastern part of Carmarthenshire will be hard hit. Carmarthenshire as a whole will be balanced out because there are more prosperous areas. Neathport Talbot is in the top 10 areas in the UK to be affected because of the concentration there. Um, so um, I think there is an interest and I hope, you know, the council has got hardly any money as, as you all know, but I think there may be an interest in doing something about increasing the advice that's available because they know for the next three, four years while this system's going through, there's going to be a huge call on any advice that's available. So any small amount they can contribute, just one more advisor somewhere in Carmarthenshire will pay off and it will pay off to the council because a lot of the people affected are people of social services who if they don't get the money are going to need extra support from social services. So there's a bottom line as well as a a willingness, um, so all, they've actually all asked to be trained up in uh, have a sort of welfare reform session. So they're all um, they're, they're getting that. Somebody else is doing it. I, I was too late to to reply on my email, so somebody else has got the contract. But I, but I'm I'm more than happy that they actually asked for it, and I just hope that they go away from there thinking, yes, it's horrendous. And that's the message I want to leave you with: is yes, it's horrendous that people are having to go through this. But there are things that can be done that. If there are opportunities to make things easier that if you find out more about the process for PIP then the change could be better, the proactive idea. Um, or you can support people. If people get knocked off the ESA then if they get the support they may very well get it back. So, uh, That's what, from what I understand, my situation in fact comes in unfortunately because the points are really in my favour. Right, um, Wait. Well, that's another option, you know. Like, when, 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 when
Right. Right, so um, for, for your daughter, that PIP isn't going to be an issue until she's 16, because at the moment PIP is only for 16 to 64-year-olds. The power is there in the Act eventually to abolish DLA completely, which will mean PIP will go from birth up to, well, up, uh, right through into pension age. But at the moment they're not doing that because they want to, because it's going to be more complicated for children because of all the different conditions and specialities. So they want to get it, try it out and get it working to some extent. Um, because if they throw a load of disabled children off, it doesn't get good headlines. <laughs> but, you know, cynically. Realistically, how many years would it be if, you know, if they're considering extending the age down? There isn't a sort of, they haven't given it, you know, the Welfare Reform Act gives them the power to abolish DLA for children. But all they've said at the moment is they want to see PIP embedded in the working age population before they make a decision. So I suppose, you know, they will, in a couple of years' time, they'll, they'll have a good practical knowledge of how PIP's working, and they might start thinking about it then. I don't know, but um, the other thing is try another, you know, um, advice is short and hard to come by, but it might be worth getting a second opinion about whether you do anything on DLA. Yeah, yeah. Are we doing time-wise, sorry, Jack? Uh, are you getting uh, pension credit as a couple? Right. Um, what will happen is that at some point when they, they'll, they'll put changes into pension credit, which will mean that you won't be able to get pension credit. Um, but then um, you'd have to go under universal credit, but then there will be, I think, transitional protection would apply. And I'll check that up and, and get an answer to you, you know, via Joanne, because um, that's something, yeah, what does happen? I think notionally, the pension credit make, unless they're going to protect existing users, uh, existing, existing claimants, and just do it for the new claimants, um, I'll, I need, yeah. Um, but there's a potential. It may be that it's only going to... I think, actually, and I will double-check this, I think existing people are fine. Because I remember somebody um, at a course I went to, somebody who's really gone into the depths of that particular area, um, uh, and he was giving an example of somebody who's past retirement age, who th who's gets a call, you know, at 67, gets a call from the old workplace saying, oh, can you come back for three months? And they think, oh, that'd be quite interesting. I'd like to do that. Hold on a moment. Because then when they came back to pension credit, it will be a new claim and they'd be hit by the rules. But if you carry on on pension credit, then I think you should be OK. But I will double check that for you. Um, there's all, all, the, all these points are designed to somehow look objective and you know that's what the government is saying there's a huge amount of subjectivity what they've given is lots of guidance though um, generally aids and adaptions just as with DLA actually can count in your favor and against you the fact that you need to use an adaption at all, you know, it's sometimes when you're writing on a DLA form, or do I put it down when well, you when well, you should anyway? But on the one hand, the fact that perhaps you've got a disabled shower or um, special steps or ramps or whatever shows a certain level of disability because social services don't have money to burn to give ramps to anybody who fancies a, a nice. <laughs> I like to I like I like to roll down the slope into the garden <laughs> sort of thing. Um, so on the one hand, it's an indication. On the other hand, it helps you do the activity in a way that you wouldn't without the disability. Um, the number of times in DLA tribunals and somebody saying, oh, "I can't manage to tip the pan," and they say, "The slotted spoon." You know, I have you thought of using a slotted spoon? And they say, "Oh, thank." 
thank you very much for that nice suggestion, not realising. You know. um, and I, I had this vision in my head of wanting to get all the slotted spoons in the world together and set light <laughs> to them, you know, because uh, they're being used to actually discount DLA. Well, under PIP, for example, the fact that you need to use a slotted spoon would actually give you two points under their equivalent of the cooking test. So that the use of aids and adaptions, that minimal level, <coughs> will work in your favour. But again, when they're looking at how uh, more difficult, uh, uh, higher up the scale of difficulties, then they will be looking at, well, this could this measure, if it's a reasonable measure, just as under DLA, if this was in place, um, and it's reasonable and it's available to you and all of that sort of uh, guidance. Um, so they can't just sort of say, oh, well, if you had a stair lift, your problems on the stairs are sorted because getting a stair lift in is, is not easy. It's not, you can't just... But if it's something cheap and cheerful, not the slotted spoon, thankfully, for, so they're saved from the bonfire, um, they will... Um, uh, that could count against you in the sense that you can do that activity. Um, but there's some... There's a lot of... Uh, because they want to avoid having so much case law, DLA is full of case law about what happens if this and the other. There's quite extensive guidance, and the points look quite harsh, but one of the biggest things that's going to be used a lot by advisors is whether you, can do an, you can't do an activity unless you can do it repeatedly, reliably, safely. So if you can't, if you could manage it, but you couldn't do it repeatedly, and that we're going to use that a lot in mobility appeals because mobility at the moment sort of looks at whether you can um, mm. do do it often, but it's really just focusing on could you manage this distance. Whereas now, yes, the goalpost has got moved to 20 yards instead of 50, but what we're saying is yes, it was 50 yards under DLA, but under under PIP, we need to look at could you do this repeatedly, reliably, and safely, and I can do it once or twice in a day, but could I do it normally through a day? No, I couldn't. So you count it. Yeah, and it's also better in PIP under variable conditions, whereas under DLA it's what does it count for most of the day? If you can't do something and part of the day under PIP, you count as not being able to do it for the whole day. So if you wake up with a load of arthritis, but then you loosen up and can do a lot of things, under DLA, you might get a bit of help at the beginning of the day, but not through the day. Under PIP, you cannot, if you can't uh, do things early in the morning, you can't do it for the whole day as far as PIP's concerned. So it could make that there could be winners under PIP. The big losers under PIP are going to be people who need supervision because there are no points for supervision. So if the reason you get DLA is because of a risk to yourself, there are no points available for risk. Uh, the, well, there are, but not, not in the same way as under DLA. So somebody who manages their day-to-day -day tasks but has epileptic fits doesn't score much under daily living. They might do better, actually, under PIP mobility, but they'll lose under PIP daily living. Um, yeah, the swings and roundabouts. We'll see that... Uh, there's going to be winners and losers. But hopefully, um, yeah. I, as Gaines say, it's despair in the, some, the amount of changes to get your heads around. All the detail, if you want it, will be in the information. And obviously, you can send these slides around as well. Um, if you want to re-watch it, who knows what the video it might It might have to be taken off the shelves <laughs> as, as not fit for children under the age of 14. <laughs> um, but uh, thank you very much for, for bearing with me from, for that and your questions. Thank you. Thank you.